Hi everyone, welcome to today's sustainability career webinar. We're very excited today to hear from Katie Modick, the Executive Director of Communitopia. Thanks Katie, take it away. You got it. So like, you, like Kelly just said, um, this is a sustainability career webinar and I'm really excited to be with you guys today. I want to tell you about um, my role and about nonprofits in general today and Communitopia, but I also want to hear about you guys. And so I want to start our webinar today by having you guys raise your hand if you care about the planet Earth. Yes, okay, excellent. How about this one? Give a thumbs up if you care about the community around you, your neighbors, the people who live on your street, your family. I see a bunch of thumbs up. Awesome. That picture, that map is a picture of Allegheny County. Give a thumbs up if you think you live in Allegheny County. That's where the city of Pittsburgh is located and a lot of the smaller towns around Pittsburgh. Give a thumbs up if you live in Allegheny County. We might be coming from other places today too, but each of us has a community right that we that we live in and so a lot of you put a thumbs up you care about the community you live in one last little poll give a wave if you believe that you have the power to be part of solving the problems that you see in the world give a wave if you feel like you know what I can be part of creating solutions awesome so I see a lot of us have a lot in common you guys answered if you waved and gave that thumbs up and put your hands up okay then you and i have something in common and what that tells me about you is that i think you probably have a pretty big heart right you care about the world around you you care about the people around you and you think you can make a difference and i put this word non not-for-profit organization in a heart because I want to teach you today. I work for a nonprofit organization and I want to teach you today about what the difference is between a nonprofit organization and a for profit organization because I think that's really important before I tell you about my job. Okay. So, what is a nonprofit organization? What is a nonprofit organization? There's that little heart, it's on there still. You guys met me. My name is Katie Modick. I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization named Communitopia. And a nonprofit organization, its heart is, its, its beating heart is its mission. The whole reason that the organization exists is because the people who work for that organization and the people who support it believe in the mission. So I put on here a nonprofit organization is driven by its mission. Okay, let's give an example. What does that mean? Well, Communitopia's mission, what I believe in, the reason I work for Communitopia is because I believe that it's really important that we slow climate change and create healthier communities. That is the mission of Communitopia. Every nonprofit organization is going to have its own mission. It might be about finding pets, finding homeless pets a home. It might be about bringing food to people who don't have food, right? But in, in the case of Communitopia, we're an environmental nonprofit. In our whole mission, the whole all the programs that we create are about slowing climate change and creating healthier communities, because that's what we believe in. So just as a review, a nonprofit organization, the mission is the driving force behind the work, okay? Everything we do is to make our mission true, come true, versus a, a more, traditional for-profit organization, the profit from the sales are often the driving force behind the work, okay? Both are important. It's great to have nonprofit organizations, it's great to have for-profit organizations, but they are in existence for different reasons, okay? So I'm a good match for a nonprofit organization because I am really motivated to work to realize the mission, okay? I, I'm, I'm oriented well that way so that's an important thing to understand if you go into for-profit or nonprofit, what what are you motivated by right so that's why i work in the nonprofit sector now looking at the sustainable development goals slowing climate change and creating healthier communities matches with a lot of them right healthier communities are communities that are just healthier communities are communities that are 
um, looking at, at inequalities. But what, what, what Communitopia is really good at in, in our area and in around Pittsburgh is providing opportunities for climate action. Okay, so slowing climate change and creating healthier communities, we are interested in providing opportunities for people who care about climate change to take action. Okay, and so that's the one that I highlighted today of the sustainable development goals. All right, so today you're going to learn a little bit more about how is an organization um, taking action on climate change. Okay, and then what is my role? What do I do as the leader of that organization? So the very first thing, how does a nonprofit organization realize their mission to slow climate change and create healthier communities? The first thing that a nonprofit organization does to realize its mission, it has to figure out what the problem is. It has to identify the problem, okay? So I'm gonna show you two slides right now about types of ways that we identify problems. We are looking at research, and we're looking at research like things that say the climate crisis will profoundly affect the health of every child today. Okay, we see that as a very large problem. It's not fair. It's not fair that the younger you are, the more impacted you are by climate change, by our changing climate. We see that as a problem, and so we want to be part of the solution, right? Another example of a problem that, uh, that a nonprofit's looking at, in, in this case, most teachers don't teach climate change, but four and five parents wish they did. We realize that there's a problem. There's not a lot of formal education on climate change in the schools, right? And that there's an important niche that an organization like ours can fill so that we can make sure that teachers and students are, are able to, to um, get information and have opportunities to take action on climate change or to be part of the solution if they're interested, right? And so nonprofit organizations and leaders like myself are looking at the problems in the world that are related to our mission, and we're trying to develop programs that help solve those problems, okay? So that is part of what I do. So here's an example of what do we do? How does Communitopia realize our mission to slow climate change and create healthier communities? I have, the second thing we do is we create those solutions, right? So we do this in three, sort of three major ways with three different groups of audiences. The first one is we develop youth programs on climate change that we bring to young people. We also develop educator programs on climate change, which we bring to educators who are interested in having resources, okay? And then the last thing we do is we bring our programs into the wider community so that people who maybe aren't in the schools or the educator groups that we work with still have an opportunity um, to take action on climate change. And that third one is at the Squirrel Hill Library. We ran a bunch of programs during teen time last summer at the libraries. And, um, the main thing at the very bottom of this slide, I put Educate and Power Act, Educate and Power Act, Educate and Power Act. That is the main thing that we do. We provide education, we empower the groups of students and teachers and adults that we work with, and we, we offer them opportunities for action. Okay, so that we're learning right now, what does it, what does it mean to be in a nonprofit? What does Communitopia, the nonprofit, do? Right, and you can see that we're identifying problems and we're trying to solve problems. We develop programs to help solve problems. A couple pictures to show how we educate. Here's students you guys can see in classrooms. We bring workshops on climate change right into schools. We talk about things like greenhouse gases and weather versus climate. We also work with a lot of other nonprofits and for-profits in the community to do um, programming in in parks and at different events. So on the far right hand side there, you see a partner organization of ours doing community outreach at something called Future Fest, which is a big festival that Communitopia organizes every year. So we are educating, we're teaching people who are interested about the simple science behind climate change. We're empowering people. What does it mean to empower? It means that you help people see that they're not alone. You bring groups of people together and you provide them powerful opportunities to take an individual action and amplify it, right? You help provide empowerment by bringing people together and creating groups that, um, that want to be in community around something um, that, they, that they all care about. And then we act, we provide opportunities for action. So we run climate action teams at schools. We run Pittsburgh Youth for Climate Action, which is a youth group for students from college and high school who want to be involved in climate change and taking action on climate change. Some of the different actions that we do are, we, um, we go to rallies, we go to marches, we write letters to, 
to leaders. We identify leaders who might care about our message and we practice um, civic engagement. So there's a lot of different ways that we act together in, in community in order to um, realize our mission, which is slowing down, slowing climate change, right? Sometimes we are literally trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by doing things like changing out inefficient light bulbs in a school. Sometimes we are doing more um, awareness, building awareness about climate change and helping other people um, care about the issue as well or become part of a group if they, if they wanna be involved, okay? So what exactly, if you guys, if, if any of this is interesting to you, right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, how could I do what Katie does? How could I become the executive director of a nonprofit? And what really does, does Katie have to do to do this successfully? This next slide, you've been thinking that, this next slide is gonna give you a little information on what it is that I do in my role as an executive director to help realize our mission. So a big thing that you do is you help your organization raise money so that you can provide um, the programming that, that you care about. I support my staff right? We're a tiny nonprofit. There's only two of us, but I also have a board of directors. And so that's a bigger group. And really, I sort of manage all of those individuals and help lead them, right? A good leader has people who want to follow them. So it's my job to make sure that I'm being an effective leader, communicating well, supporting my staff and the board. I also am responsible for setting the vision for our organization. So I have to have a really broad, good understanding of um, the problem that we're trying to solve, what's happening locally in our own community, who are the organizations that we might want to be partnering with, and you're sort of constantly creating the vision for your organization. So you have to be visionary to be a good executive director. Um, you also have to be, um, promote the brand really is, means that you have to be a good communicator. Okay, so everything that, as, as a leader of an organization, you're sort of the face of your organization. So everything you say and, and you do sort of becomes your organization's brand. And so you have to delegate to a team who can help you build your communications or um, just really help build that brand. And all of those things on that far right hand side, you guys see that yellow arrow, all of that helps you realize your mission. Okay, so you're really working to help your organization realize the mission by doing some of these um, daily tasks. And skills that you might need if you wanted to become an executive director of a nonprofit organization, you'll find yourself um, needing to be, to, to grow skills in public speaking, in organizing, in researching, teaching, so being able to talk about your, um, the things that you care about well with other people, evaluating, which means looking at what it is your organization's doing and deciding how you could do it a little bit better. Writing is a really important skill. Give me a little hand raise or just a wave of your hand if you have ever tried any of these things before. Have any of you ever done public speaking, organizing, writing? I can see hands in the air. So you're already developing some of the skills that you would want to continue to develop if you were interested in being an executive director for a nonprofit. This isn't the only list of skills. There's, there's a lot more skills and each individual would bring their own set of skills. Um, but this is just, just in general, some of the skills that you that you might be using um, as an executive director. What types of things would you maybe wanna study in undergrad? Um, I threw up here just a few, but I didn't study any of these things. So <laughs> could be sustainability, nonprofit management or business management, whatever it is that, that's the field. So Communitopia is an environmental nonprofit, which means understanding, having a basic understanding of some of the environmental sciences might be important, right? But if you were going to be working for more of a, a human service nonprofit, then you might want to be a, to understand social work or things like that. Um, law would always be a neat thing to study. And then I put at the very bottom liberal arts, which is just a little bit more broad, right? So in my undergrad, I went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, and I studied Spanish and anthropology. And then I went back for a master's degree ten years later, and got a master's in education. And I'd been teaching um, that whole decade. And finally, after teaching um, for that long, I decided I wanted to get a master's in education. And now I'm working as an executive director of a nonprofit. So really, the truth is there's a lot of pathways that will be able to get you to different professional opportunities. And 
many, many people your age will have more than just one job, okay? That's sort of the trend right now. You'll try a handful of different opportunities and one will often lead to another and they'll open doors for each other and you'll keep building your skill set. But if you do know, right, if you already know, I know what I want to be. I know I want to work as an executive director of a nonprofit. You might want to think about some of the, the bullet points around the right as, um, as possible majors explore that just a little bit for, for undergrad. Um, how can you guys get involved in, commu in, in Communitopia and what we're doing? Um, I just want you guys to know that we are just, um, we are at such a tiny organization. We're just growing right now. We've, we've always only had one part-time staff member and now we have one and a half and we have a little bit more um, funding. And so with some of that funding, we, we, hired, uh, we hired somebody to help us build a new website. And so this is our new website. You guys are getting a sneak peek. It's not live yet. It should be live in a few weeks. But um, when the website is live, you're going to have a chance to be able to go onto Communitopia's website and learn a lot more about our current programs. So the website that we have right now is sort of old. And um, one of the old board members used to update it, and they haven't been on the board for a number of years. And so it's just sort of an older website that's not current. But our new website will be very current. And it's going to give you an opportunity to see an events calendar of different things that are happening for Communitopia. And you can click on those events and you can register to attend webinars, to join other groups of students that are doing different activities. So if you've been curious about some of the work that we're doing, you care about climate change, you want to get involved, you might want to bring a workshop to your school, um, check out the website. You can also become a member of Communitopia. Um, and that would mean that we will give specific outreach to you or to your parents if they became a member. And you'll have um, a really specific way to give feedback to Communitopia and participate in some of our programming that's just for members, just for people who really, really care about this topic and really want to get involved. And so some of the things that we're going to be doing are these monthly virtual hangouts where we'll be talking a little bit more in depth about books, and topics, articles, ideas related to climate change. And you'll have a chance to be meeting other people who aren't just your own age, right? These would be people that are from adults to young people, anybody who's interested. So there's, Communitopia is gonna have a new membership and I'm, we're really excited to launch that and to start to build um, some members around the region. Other ways that you can get involved, you can just ask if, if some of the programming can come to your school or you could get involved in some of our programming. Our programming is free. So we bring free workshops on climate change into schools. We also have Pittsburgh Youth for Climate Action, which is a youth group that we lead that is for high school and college age students. Um, and and we, we also run climate action teams at schools. So these are sort of after school clubs. A lot of different schools have clubs. Um, we run three a year. We have the staff to be able to run three of them ourselves, but we also provide training to educators. If you know that your green team might want to incorporate some climate action, we have toolkits for educators so that they also could help you run a climate action team at your school. Um, some really exciting things coming up. Some of the climate action teams that we work with are going to be hosting a virtual youth climate summit coming up next October for um, a wider group of, um, of students. And so I put my, um, my friend Lauren's email on here. She's a colleague of mine. Email her, she's running a lot of our programming. So her email's at the bottom and you can reach out to her if you would like one of these programs to come to your school or if you wanna get involved in the youth group. And then I just wanted to give you guys some more really quickly, some of my very favorite additional resources for different environmental literacy in action. And we give these out to all the groups of kids that we work with. So Green Building Alliance has an emerging youth program which talks about climate action and also the sustainable development goals. Chatham University has a Seeds of Change conference and a Sustainability Leadership Academy for high school age students. Really, really awesome opportunities. Check those out. The Frick Environmental Center has high school urban eco stewards and young naturalist summer programs that you guys could check out. FIPS also has some, some programming for high school age students. I wanted to put on here my very favorite youth-led climate movements. So a lot of what Communitopia does is about taking what youth care about and empowering them, lifting that voice. These four movements, Fridays for the Future, Sunrise Movement, Zero Hour, and I Matter, are my favorite youth-led movements. Um, and, and they're national in scale, but some of them have regional chapters here. So if you want to get involved with other youth and you want to do it, aside from just the programs that Communitopia is running, these are additional youth-led um, climate activism groups, so check those out. 
And then my very three favorite leading national organizations for climate literacy and education resources are Schools for Climate Action. They run um, really cool, really, really amazing campaigns for um, trying to get school boards to pass climate action resolutions. Alliance for Climate Education is a really great um, education resource, some of the best virtual climate resources out there. And then Young Voices for the Planet has really powerful videos of young people who have taken action on climate change and with, with results. And so great examples there if you're interested in, in climate action. So I'm, I'm going to stop now because that's a lot of information. I hope you understand a little more about what it is that I do, why I do what I do, what it means to be the executive director of a nonprofit, what it means even to to be a nonprofit, right? And I'm gonna just open it up now. My email is on here. You're welcome to email me with questions after this. Just let me know you were on the webinar today with Chatham and, and I'm happy to, um, to answer questions if they come through that way. But I'd also love just to open it up to the group now. And if there are any questions, thoughts, comments, um, I'll let Kelly go ahead and field those questions. Thanks so much, Katie. Everyone, yeah. please type your questions into the chat window. Um, I'm going to go back to something you mentioned a while ago that perhaps folks um, might not know much about. You talked about a board of directors. Can you explain a little bit what a board of directors is and how that group interacts with Communitopia? Yes. So each nonprofit, most nonprofit organizations have staff who are paid to work for that organization. And then they have a board of directors. Usually it's about nine people. That's what most um, nonprofit organizations are aiming to have a board of directors of about nine people. And that board of directors are typically volunteers and they help govern the organization. So their responsibility is to meet with the executive director and each other and to help be the governing board that makes some of the decisions about strategy for an organization, how should we use our, um, our finances, right? Our, the money that we make, how should we really move the organization forward so that, it's, so that it stays healthy. And so a board of directors are, are a group of individuals who bring their talent and their expertise to a nonprofit organization. And they also really believe in the mission. So they join the board because they believe that the organization is really important and that they're filling an important role for a community. And so that's another great opportunity for you guys as you get older. You might want to be on a board of directors. Any nonprofit that you believe in has a board of directors. And you bring your expertise. So if you're a teacher or you're a, a, a lawyer, or you are um, an accountant and you understand finances, all of those skills you can bring to the nonprofit board and you can really help that nonprofit organization thrive. And so um, a board of directors, they call it, oftentimes their role is they call it governing, which just means helping make decisions, helping make voting and making decisions that keep the nonprofit healthy. Thanks, Katie. That's a great explanation. And I know I've seen sometimes board of directors applications listed on some of the same websites or similar websites where you can find job applications. So I'll send an example of that because I think it's really interesting and something I didn't learn about until I was much older um, in our resources afterwards. Um, in our chat window, we have someone saying thank you and then asking when you were younger, what made you think you would want to get into this type of work? And was there a single event that made up your mind or were you always interested in climate change? Great question. So when I was younger, yeah, I always cared about the planet. I didn't like seeing litter. I never wanted to litter. I didn't like seeing litter on the ground. My dad picked up litter everywhere we went. So some of that is just imprinted young. You know, you just learn from, from the world around you the behaviors that you think are good behaviors. And so from a really young age, I was learning that, that the planet Earth is this interconnected web that is so sacred and so special and that there's this really important relationship between all of us who share this resource. So I, that was, that's a value of mine. You don't always get lucky enough to work and have your values be totally aligned, right? Sometimes 
we work in a job that in our values, we live our values, but maybe we don't get to live our values through that professional choice. Um, I was a teacher in the public schools for about 10 years before I started to work in the nonprofit world. And as a teacher, my biggest job was to, I, I taught um, students with special needs. And a lot of times the skill sets that they were trying to develop were in um, like early literacy intervention. So I was teaching students how to read, right? Students who had a hard time reading, I was teaching them how to read. But in, on the side, I was also starting green clubs at the schools that I worked at. And I was incorporating, even though my, my job as a teacher wasn't to stop climate change or slow climate change or create solutions for climate change, I was still incorporating that value into my lived experience with, with youth and with young people because it was motivating for all of us. And so I think you find ways, whatever your profession is, you find ways to bring what you care about the most into your world and into your life. And so it was definitely just an evolution. I never thought I will for sure be the executive director of a nonprofit organization that's an environmental nonprofit. I didn't know that. And I, and I think I'll probably have other jobs in my life as well. I think I'll probably work for 30 more years, I hope, and, and, and have other roles. But um, I came into the, the organization that I work for now, Communitopia, as their educator. And, and then an opportunity for this leadership role opened up and the board asked me if I would take that role. And so um, lots of opportunities will come your way if you are passionate about what you do and you do it the best that you can. Everybody will appreciate that, they will see that, and lots of opportunities will come your way. And so I feel really lucky that now I'm in a role where my professional world and my values are really aligned. And that's a, that's a special place to be. Thanks, Katie. I'm wondering, um, we hear sometimes in the news or as educators about, um, you know, sometimes educators might choose not to teach about climate change because climate deniers are a thing. There are parents or there are people who think climate change isn't a problem or isn't a thing and we shouldn't be learning about it in schools. Do you see much of that in your work? And when you do, how do you respond or how do you design the way that you're approaching climate change education in the first place to account for that? Yeah, such a great question. So, so lots of questions in there, um, but how do we, what, what do I encounter that a lot in the work, in my work is, is where I'll start. So um, the, the model that Communitopia runs right now is, is very optional for schools and for educators to participate. And so I find you guys saw that flyer that said free workshops on climate change for your classroom. We provide that flyer to entire staff at a school, you know, and maybe one or two of the staff members will reach out and say, that's a neat opportunity. I would enjoy having you come as a guest speaker into my classroom. And so really, for the most part, I'm only interacting with the teachers who are naturally interested in engaging on this topic and bringing that topic into their classrooms. And that is comfortable for us right now as, as an organization. And we only, we have such a small staff that that's about all we can handle. <laughs> um, but it is really important to understand that also we, we work in Allegheny County, that map that you saw. And I think that different pockets of um, Pennsylvania are going to have different experiences with the ideas around climate change. And so I think Allegheny County tends to be a little bit friendlier to engaging on climate change and wanting to take action on climate change. And some of my friends and colleagues who work in different counties, um, there's a different sort of ratio of how many people are interested in, um, in engaging in, in that way. And it might be a different challenge, you know, working outside of Allegheny County. But I think it's a really, imp even, there are always lots of questions that come up. So even in a class where, you know, the teacher has welcomed us in because they're curious to engage about climate change, even in a class um, like that, there's gonna be lots of different opinions and lots of ideas. And so, it's so important when you're in a leadership role to create space and empowerment for everybody and, and not to 
um, you really want people to have space to share their real lived experience. And so it's very okay to have diverging thoughts. It's okay for us not all to be on the same page. It's, it's, it's natural and it's absolutely okay. And so when I run a workshop, anytime that there are questions, um, I don't always have answers for everything. You know, people will ask me sometimes like, well, you said, you know, you would have the solution for climate change. What is the solution? That's a really complicated, I, I don't have an answer for that. That's a really complicated question. And um, I love pointing people in the direction of the best resources that I have found for to answer that question. But I think you have to be okay not always having the answer and also providing opportunities for us to disagree and understand that that's very natural and that is absolutely okay. And it's okay to feel passionately about something and to have somebody else feel passionately in a different way. And so um, for the most part, you know, especially when we're in a community space, a school classroom is a little bit different, but in a community space when there's definitely a diversity of opinions, um, we always just create a space and norm, like you guys normed at the beginning of this call, for anybody's ideas and opinions to be listened to and valid. And um, that's one of the ways that we help, help the dialogue um, be productive. That's so important, Katie. Thanks so much for mentioning that. I'm wondering if you have any specific examples of some of the ways that you respond to folks that um, some of the youth on the call or other educators on the call can also use. So if you uh, have a different opinion than someone else and you're talking about something and starting to, in your head, get to the point where you might turn it into a debate, but you want to leave it open and accepting and validating. What are some yeah. of the things that you say to keep that conversation open? You know, I think that a, a strategy that I use, and this also speaks a little bit to my own personality, but I love hearing people's stories. And so I think it's so important for us to learn how to tell our stories. And I would even say there, like, because, because I work in um, the field now of climate change, I would say, I think it's really important for us to tell our climate stories. And for some of us, that climate story might just be, I've been apathetic for 30 years and I'm finally realizing that I, I think I should sort of take action on this or care a little bit more. For some of us, that story might be, um, you know, my family has for four generations worked in, you know, a certain industry and, and I work for that industry and I'm proud of that. And that is my, um, you know, let's just say it's a fossil fuel industry. That's, that's my heritage and that's where I come from. And, um, and then I want to hear about that story because that's a really important story. And so I think having people tell personal stories is, is the way that we start to make connections because so many of us have so many things in common, right? So where we're coming from helps create our own lived experience and our own realities. And those are all all valid lived experiences and valid realities. And so I think um, oftentimes I ask questions about, tell me your story and I wanna know about that. And that just helps build a relationship. And you're not, I, I'm not interested in proving my point. I'm not interested in having a debate where I win an argument. Um, that's just not my approach. So I'm much more interested in learning about people's lived experience and agreeing to disagree or just saying, you know, we, we see this differently and here's where I'm coming from. So um, that would be a strategy that I employ because my, my ultimate goal isn't to be right. My ultimate goal is to, um, is to have meaningful conversation. That's awesome. And it's also really aligned with um, when you met with Daniel Rossi Keen from Riverwise, who talked a lot about the importance and value of storytelling. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of great resources uh, under his webinar too related to that. Uh, another question from the chat window. What have you learned about being a leader through this position? And do you have any advice on how to be a good, effective leader that can get people inspired about your mission? <laughs> I'm still learning what it means to be a good leader, but I think um, part of being a good leader, basically maybe the definition of a good leader would be that people follow you. Right. So are you actually leading as in like people are following you? And when when I talk about people, I would mean first and foremost, um, the staff that I'm responsible for, for supporting and managing. Are they following my lead? The board, are they following my lead? If I bring ideas and opinions to the board, are they do they trust me and are they following my lead? And so um, how do you get somebody to follow your lead? And I think that you have there's 
we talked a little bit about some of those skills, right? A lot of that is um, you, people, people believe in you when they know you can be effective. And to be effective, you have to develop skills. And so you have to be effectively able to do your job, perform your job duties. So that's a part of it, right? It's building your skill set so that you are effective in your role and then people are going to trust you. Um, but also, I think that you really, as to be a good leader, you have to realize that everybody's watching you. And so you set the tone. If you are working 24-7, that is the tone that you're setting for the entire organization. And that's, that's modeling to your staff that they should be working 24 seven or something's wrong with them. You have to really be healthy to be a good leader. I think you have to lead in a way that is inspiring because you're taking care of yourself and you're um, taking care of your staff. And, and I think there's a lot of nurturing that comes from from good leaders. They, um, they recognize that and they realize that and you have to find joy in your work to be a good leader. And so if you're just stressed out and burned out all the time or just overwhelmed by the level of responsibility um, all the time, that's gonna come no matter what, but you, know, you have to have strategies for getting yourself back to a healthy balanced place. And so I think good leaders learn how to do that. And then, then they, they can stay in that role for the long haul. You know? And just taking it easy on yourself, knowing that we're all learning, all learning all the time. So um, you don't have to know it all to be a great leader, but you do have to own up to what you need support with and help with and be honest. And um, all of those are important qualities, I would say. So valuable for you to say that, Katie. Thank you. Um, if you <laughs> have more questions, feel free to type them into the chat window. And uh, if adults have questions on the call too, feel free to type those in at this point. Um, Katie, I know we've we've been sharing with folks about your upcoming um, webinar with the students from Woodland Hills, so they can share um, some of how they've been successful with other students or other educators. Can you maybe say a little bit more about, without giving away everything that they're gonna talk about, um, <laughs> that's such a great story of the success that, that they have had at Woodland Hills. Can you talk a little bit about um, what the students did there, uh, perhaps as a teaser for your, your webinar and um, to help students on the call feel like maybe they can do the same? Yeah, definitely. So you guys know that we um, bring workshops on, on climate change into schools and part of that workshop, those are 90 minute workshops, but the biggest, most important part of that workshop is how do we take action on climate change? If we care about this, if we believe that we can be part of the solution and we wanna take action, um, how, how can we do that? And so anytime that we're coming to a school, we collect a little information from the group of kids beforehand. We do a survey so that we learn a little bit about what things you already care about. And we try to create solutions that match what it is that you already care about. So in the case of Woodland Hills, they were concerned that, um, that the they were frustrated that it seemed like maybe the politicians historically haven't done that much to change things, even though they've known about climate change for a long time. We, Congress still hasn't passed any policies um, that are specifically related to climate change. And so that was frustrating to the students. And um, so we decided to do a civic engagement action plan with, with the group of students. And that action plan, the kids wrote letters to their school board asking their school board to pass a climate action resolution. And school boards love their students. Their entire job is to create policy that nurtures young people. And so when a group of students goes to their school board and says climate change is a children's issue, we are impacted by this. Both our mental health and our physical well-being are impacted by this, this existential crisis that we're in. Um, we want you to speak up for us. We want, we want you to do something. At the very least, make a public statement so that there is a little bit more political pressure on state officials and you know, local county officials. They hear you. School board members are elected officials. So they hear these other elected officials saying, we care about climate change. <clears throat> our kids, our students care about climate change. We're going to take a stance. We as educators cannot be silent on this issue. And so the group of kids basically create, they wrote letters and then they made videos of themselves making statements because it was hard to logistically get the students to the school board meetings, which happen at night. So they just made videos of themselves and they were scripts that we practiced 
So Communitopia brought a lot of that resource to the classroom. What are sample scripts? What are drafts of letters you could write? Things like that. And then the students um, made them their own and they made videos. And I went to the school board meeting with all these videos and we presented them to the school board. And six months later, the school board passed the very first climate action resolution in the state of Pennsylvania. And so they went down in history, like a, you know, a group of kids right here in Allegheny County from Woodland Hills School District, a group of eighth graders, got their school board to pass a resolution. And what's, what is a result of that resolution is gonna be unique depending on the language of the resolution. But this particular resolution asks the school board to implement a climate change committee. And that committee is responsible for advising the school board on eco-friendly policy, basically, and advocacy for that students can participate in. And so right now, there's a group of um, students, teachers, and community members, and Communitopia is, is part of this group, and Chatham is part of this group, um, individuals who, who care a lot about making sure that this committee has great resources. Um, the district is going to implement a climate change curriculum which means that the students are going to have curriculum on climate change in their classes next year and the years after and the years after. So that's a really important project. And then they're also creating a really robust student advocacy group at Woodland Hills so that kids can, can continue to, to take action on climate change. And then there's one committee that's working on the buildings and grounds and making sure that the food services are sustainable and that um, the policies and decisions and contracts that the district signs on to are eco-friendly. So if they're signing a new energy contract, is it with renewable energy or is it with traditional burning fossil fuels? And it's really, really a wonderful initiative. And it all started because a group of students were um, petitioning their school board to pass a climate action resolution. So Communitopia is happy to bring that workshop to your school if you want more help with a group of students understanding how you can do that. Um, you can also look on School for Clim Schools for Climate Action's website, which I put in the resources. Um, that is where we got all of our information. And so either of those ways, if you want it to be hands-on hands and guided, Communitopia is happy to do that. If you just want the resources, go to Schools for Climate Action's website because they have lots of resources right there. But really important work um, and really tangible and meaningful work for for students your guys' age because your school board cares a lot about what you think and so it's a really important audience for you to tap into thanks katie and thanks for mentioning that folks can just go straight on to schools for change for anyone who's watching this that's not in allegheny county and can't have communitopia come to your school you can do this without adults you can yes. you can do this advocacy without someone like katie helping you to get through it um totally. so, for those that can have Communitopia in their schools, definitely do it. Um, all right, we're getting a little bit low on time. We have about 10 minutes left, so if folks have more questions, feel free to type them in. The next one that we have from the chat window for you, Katie, is what are some of the challenges that you face in your work? Mm. You know, I would say some of the biggest challenges are time management. <laughs> so um, there are, I, there are so many important things to attend to from like our financial statements, you know, like just making sure that our financial statements are in order to some of the bigger things like strategic thinking, where is the organization going in the next five years, um, and then everything in between. So running our programming effectively, all the things that, that were sort of mentioned earlier, you know, these different pillars, fundraising, making sure that we have the funds to do all of this effectively, and then making sure that all those things align. It's time consuming. And so I'd say one of the biggest challenges is project prioritization and um, really getting, getting organized and getting to a place where um, time management, where you're not, it's a challenge for me, because the to-do lists are so, so long that um, I, I often just, and then that's not even, you know, responding to all the emails that come in that you're sort of just reacting to. And so before you're even reacting to anybody else's desires of you, your own to-do list is so long that um, the time management and project prioritization is probably one of my biggest like daily challenges. And, um, but it's a really important skill. It, it is a skill and, and it's something that um, that I'm continuing to work on developing in this particular role. So each 
professional role that will look a little different? Great question. Katie, is this your dream job or is there some other future different dream job you have in mind? <laughs> this is, this is as close as I could get to my dream job. So uh, one more dream that I have, I am a very adventurous human being and I am the happiest, my happiest happy place is being on a big physical adventure outdoors. And so my dream, dream job would be to like do climate advocacy for a nonprofit in a leadership role out in the field somewhere, you know, not necessarily behind a desk all the time, but maybe on big three month long bike rides and then big sailing trips and get to live this um, part of my life that I save for tiny pockets of like the one week vacation that I take, you know, and I try to do something like that. But I am working to create some of our fundraising strategy around crowdfunding um, around the marathon, for example. And we're going to do a big youth climate ride up to DC on the Gap Trail. And, you know, some of these events that were unfortunately canceled this year. But in future years, um, I can hopefully weave some of my own dreams, my own passions, and how I spend my free time even more deeply into, um, into my role in Communitopia. But if I was, you know, going to get a new job, I'd probably start my own nonprofit and have it be a little bit more like adventure-based climate advocacy kind of a thing. I love it. I will <laughs> totally be there if you're doing adventure-based <laughs> climate advocacy and for that ride on the gap. What have been some of your favorite personal adventures that you've done in the past? You know, I did a really impacting bike ride from California to Florida. It took me four months and I, I camped the whole way and it was really fun to go that slowly. So you're going, re I did the Southern tier. So you're really biking slowly through, you know, these little tiny towns in Mississippi and Alabama and Texas. It took us three weeks to get through Texas. And because you're camping, you know, I love camping. I love waking up outdoors, just sort of being outside for, for months on end um, all day and all night is really fun for me. So that was, that was in my 20s and and i would highly recommend that for anybody who wants an adventure it was it was great um I, there's <clears throat> there's a nice list but that's probably that's probably one of my highlight 